My husband, children, and I just spent a wonderful time traveling through California. We experienced the majesty of Yosemite. We met farmers in the Central Valley and spoke to innovators in Silicon Valley, not to mention the beautiful sunsets we experienced along the way. But nothing compares to the feeling of coming home. There was a moment in my life when I almost lost the opportunity to be home. I was born in the US, but when I was five months old, my mother abruptly left to be with her dying brother in Mexico. She took me with her. Days and then weeks passed, and soon my mother became distraught. How would she return home to my father and our lives in the US? One day, two Catholic nuns visiting from Texas stopped by. My mother relayed her dilemma, and hearing her agony, the nuns insisted we leave with them first thing the next morning. And so, carrying only a small diaper bag, my mother and I set out with the nuns. As we approached the border crossing at the Rio Grande, my mother sat in the back seat and nervously cradled me in her arms. The nuns, in their dark wool habits, waved to the border patrol as we crossed into the United States. I was back home. For the better part of my childhood, my parents were undocumented. They raised me and my brothers and sisters in a predominantly Latino neighborhood in Chicago. We struggled, but like many immigrant families, they never flinched at taking the hardest jobs at the lowest wages to make it here. And like most Americans, their dream was to create a better future for me and my siblings. Being American to me is the notion that despite my humble upbringing, I could live up to my full potential and have as much opportunity to prosper as anyone else. For the last 22 years, I've been a public servant. Currently, I serve as state director for United States Senator Dick Durbin the second highest ranking senator in Congress and chair of the Senate Judiciary. In my role, I meet people from all walks of life from across Illinois, from the dairy farmer downstate, to the CEO in Chicago, to the manufacturing plant owner in Rockford, and school children everywhere. Over the last two decades, I've been a part of every immigration reform effort taken up by Congress. One of my first roles was as an immigration caseworker, helping people become legal residents and US citizens. But I'd never come across a case for an undocumented child. One day in 2000, that changed. My phone rang. It was the head of a nonprofit that helps that provides music education to youth. She called about their most promising student, Teresa. Teresa was a musical prodigy. A self-taught pianist, Teresa had spent several years perfecting her craft alongside amazing musicians, competing at the top of her class, and playing in Chicago's most prestigious classical venues. As Teresa approached, her high school graduation, her teachers knew that all the best music conservatories in the country would be thrilled to have her. But Teresa, she couldn't dare to dream about college. You see, Teresa was born in Brazil to Korean parents. And when she was two years old, they immigrated to the United States. She was now 17 years old, living her entire life at that point in America as an undocumented immigrant. So I called immigration and asked what we needed to do. I figured, given Teresa's circumstance, updating her immigration status would be an easy fix. How naive. Right away, immigration told me that Teresa wasn't an American. She wasn't a citizen. She wasn't a resident. She had no legal standing in this country. In fact, they said 
Teresa had to leave for 10 full years if she ever wanted the opportunity to return and live here legally. And in that moment, that response seemed, from a value standpoint, from my own personal understanding of what my country represents, it felt like the most un-American answer to Teresa's situation. But from an historic standpoint, it also felt like the most American answer possible. Our country's first naturalization law took effect in 1790. It said that free white persons could gain citizenship if they lived here for two years and had good moral character. And once they became citizens, their children could become citizens too. And so from the very beginning, our first naturalization law excluded Native Americans and all those who were enslaved. It wasn't until the passage of the 14th Amendment in 1868 that the U.S. recognized as citizens all persons born in the United States. And even then, as a country, we've worked to exclude others, Chinese immigrants in the 1890s, Japanese immigrants during World War II, and more recently, immigrants from Muslim countries. Time and time again, our country has changed the rules, moving the goalpost for new immigrants, working to exclude those who don't fit a certain profile. In doing that, we've missed the point. Being American isn't about how you look, the color of your skin, or who you pray to. We wrongly describe ourselves as a country of immigrants. I believe we're a country because of immigrants. At every moment in American history, immigrants have given their brilliance, their labor, and their lives for this country. From the farm workers who toil in the fields in suffocating heat, to the founders of Fortune 100 companies, including Google, Tesla, Pfizer, and Intel, just to name a few. So you see, we realized we had a major problem with Teresa. This singular case that had made it to my desk had quickly inspired a movement. Teresa was dreamer number one, but she was not alone. We uncovered hundreds and then thousands of immigrant children who grew up as Americans, but legally weren't. This is their home, and yet they're not legally able to live out their dreams here. Teresa's story would move us to create the DREAM Act, a pathway to citizenship for immigrant children. Following its introduction by Senator Durbin, the first Senate hearing was scheduled on September 12th 2001. On the morning of September 11th, I was scheduled to be on a flight to Washington, D.C. My flight never made it out of Chicago. And in the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, there was a fury of anti-immigrant sentiment and punitive immigration proposals. In response, immigrants, especially dreamers and their allies, took to the streets demanding fair and just laws. In 2006, this led to the largest immigrant support rallies that drew millions of people across cities. Over the next decade, there was a groundswell of support, though it wasn't always easy. In 2009, while boarding a plane to see her family for spring break, Karen, a 19-year-old college freshman, was stopped by a Customs and Border Patrol agent. She was detained, placed in a blue jumpsuit, and placed in isolation. Karen spent a harrowing three days in a county jail. She was immediately placed in removal proceedings and deemed not legally present. Karen had known no other home She'd arrived in the U.S. with her mother 
and sister at the age of two. She knew no other home, and she had spent nearly her entire life here. She had earned a scholarship to attend college. She had studied hard, performed well in school, volunteered in her community, and was poised to have an otherwise bright future. When I took the call, I recognized the desperate nature in the person's voice on the other end. They needed help to stop Karen's deportation. So I called immigration and worked to secure a stay of removal so she could fight her case here. Soon, my phone started ringing with calls of case after case of dreamers caught up in deportation. The calls came from Illinois and from across the country. Dreamers who were going about their lives, following the rules, were now facing the prospect of having to leave the only home they knew. I started to work on each case that came to my attention, working on temporary solutions to their deportation. The situation was so unreasonable, I found myself tracking dreamers down from one detention center to another. Since its first introduction, Senator Durbin has worked to pass the DREAM Act in every session of Congress since 2001. And in the intervening years, the DREAM Act has been included in every major proposal of immigration reform, and it's been considered five separate times without success. In 2010, dreamers came out of the shadows knowing that being undocumented and unafraid was a way to ensure that their stories would be told for all to see in the light of day. Dozens of dreamers in their caps and gowns even filled the Senate gallery one Saturday morning, a week before Christmas, to witness the vote. As for Karen, she was one decision away from having to leave her country, her family, and her hopes and dreams behind. On June 15, 2012, one month after Karen graduated from college, I was in the car with Senator Durbin, who I consider the biggest champion of the DREAM Act. We're just a few minutes away from arriving at our event when my cell phone rings. It was President Barack Obama. In the quiet of the car, I could hear the president's voice. He had called to tell the senator that he was taking an executive action that very afternoon that would protect dreamers from deportation and give them a chance to thrive in America. Immediately, the senator and I knew we had just achieved a bridge for millions of dreams. Right away, we got to work. Within 60 days, dreamers and immigrant communities from across the country mobilized so they were ready to register with the government on day one, August 15, 2012. This is that day. Thousands and thousands of dreamers with their families came out to claim their place in history. Teresa and Karen among them. More than 800,000 youth have benefited from DACA and have gone on to contribute in meaningful ways. Today, Teresa is thriving in New York City. She's earned both a bachelor's and a doctorate degree from the Manhattan School of Music. She teaches, she gives back, and she's played at Carnegie Hall. Karen went on to obtain her law degree from Northwestern University and helps others who find themselves in similar situations she was in years ago. There are no words that can properly describe how I felt sitting in the audience at the Chicago Theater when Karen received her law degree. It's been 21 years since Teresa inspired the DREAM Act. I said earlier that we're a country because of immigrants. We're a thriving country because of the work, the drive, 
the resilience of wave after wave of immigrants, despite the challenges that each immigrant group has faced as they came to claim their opportunity, their place in America, they've prevailed. And because of them, America has prevailed. So I ask you, are Teresa, Karen, and the hundreds of thousands of dreamers who call America home, are they American? As Americans, we pride ourselves in the notion that this is the land of opportunity. Dreamers are the epitome of that notion. They've embraced our way of life. They live out our American values and ideals even before they're able to obtain America's full promise. When will we embrace them and give them the opportunity to make their claim in this country? When will we stop erecting barriers to the dream of opportunity? My mother likes to point out that when we crossed the border with the nuns, I'd been crying uncontrollably the entire drive to the border. So badly, she considered turning back, fearing my crying might be a bad omen. By the time we reached the border, I was fast asleep. And just after we were waved across, I gave out an audible sigh of relief that everyone in the car noted. I was home. I've dedicated my life to this country. And as I stand here, I can proudly say I've claimed my place in America. It is time that we create the same opportunity for the thousands of dreamers who've earned not only their place, but their home too.